After almost half a decade of working as a product manager in tech, I can confidently say that this career path has significantly changed my life in various ways, both professionally and personally. From having direct impact and influence over products and services that reach customers, to financial stability that was provided by six-figure salaries, to entrepreneurship opportunities, personal growth, and so much more. And although product management has become very popular, lucrative, and relevant in the tech field, to this day, I will get the question of, but what do you really do as a product manager? I've done tens and tens of Zoom sessions, Zoom calls with my friends, sharing my screen and explaining my role as a product manager. And I found it to be quite challenging, especially when I'm explaining my role to those who are not familiar with the field. So I've decided to film this video and I want this video to serve as a straightforward way of explaining the role of a product manager. And I've broken this video down into two parts. The first part of the video is going to explain what product management is in an easy and relatable way without overwhelming you with too much technical detail. And the second part of the video is going to dive deeper into the role and dive deeper into some of those technical words and elements that might seem a little scary in the beginning. Now, if you're someone who is just wondering what a product manager does on a surface level, I do recommend that you just watch the first part of the video. But if you're someone who is trying to break into product management and actually turn it into a career, I do recommend that you stick until the very end of this video. First, we're gonna start with the basics. You know how you use an app or a website and it has all those features that make it easy and enjoyable to use? So as a product manager, I am responsible for creating, improving, and maintaining those features. And now let's look at the role of a product manager using an everyday example. Think of a product manager as the conductor of an orchestra. But instead of working with musicians as a product manager, I work with designers, engineers, and other experts to create products and services that will make other people's lives better. Just like a conductor would work with musicians to create a beautiful piece of music. So another good way of explaining what a product manager does is highlighting the customer focus. One of the main responsibilities of a product manager is to understand what kind of products and services people need and want. So as a product manager, my responsibility would be to talk to customers, gather feedback, and use that information to create services and products that people will actually need and want. So decision-making is another responsibility of a product manager in their day-to-day -day lives. So as a product manager, I would need to decide which features should be introduced or improved next, just like a conductor would in an orchestra when deciding which song should be played first, second, third, etc. So problem solving is another skill that a product manager has to have and it's something that takes up a lot of their time. So for example, as a product manager, I would have to deal with tricky problems and I would need to come up with efficient ways of solving those problems. Say if a feature broke or if users aren't able to check out on a website, I would have to, together with my team, resolve that problem. Just like a conductor would need to take care of a musician's broken instrument right before a live concert. And I think that highlighting team collaboration is also a good way of explaining what I do as a product manager. So imagine those websites that you love using. Those websites are a product of team collaboration. So behind that website or an app that you're using, there's a team made up of a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. So this first part of the video was dedicated to explaining the essence of my role to you and to my friends without overwhelming you with too much technical detail. Now, moving on to the second part of this video, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into some of the technical details. And we're gonna talk about planning and prioritization 
feature development, meetings and collaboration, as well as documentation. So let's go ahead and get started with planning and prioritization. It is very important for a product manager to understand where they stand in the calendar year of their organization so that they can be retrospective, meaning they can look back and see what's been done so far to bring the product to where it is today and to be able to plan for the future. It is also important that a product manager understands where they stand in the calendar year so that they can take big goals and break these goals down into specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time-bound goals. So companies usually will take a calendar year and they'll break it down into quarters. So there'll be four quarters in a year, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. And as you see on this board, every quarter is also divided into three months. So we have January, February, March in Q1, April, May, and June in Q2, July, August, September in Q3, and October, November, December in Q4. Q4 is usually very, very tricky because December is full of holidays and a lot of people, a lot of your team members will take time off. So it is very important to plan your work the right way and to make sure that you're not committing to more than you can achieve. And so every month is then divided into sprints. So what is a sprint? <clears throat> a sprint is basically a time block, a time period, throughout which the team works to complete certain tasks. Usually in tech companies, you will see sprints lasting anywhere from one week to four weeks, but I'm used to working in two week sprints. And so just for the sake of this video, we're gonna stick to two week sprints. And so if you take a look at your quarter, you only have six sprints in a quarter. It's not that many sprints. And so every month usually has two sprints. So when we take a look at this calendar year, just for the sake of this video, we're gonna imagine that we're a product manager at this ABC e-commerce company, and I am just about to start Sprint 14. I'm at the end of Sprint 13, just about to start Sprint 14. Once I've understood where I stand on the calendar year, I wanna understand where I stand as part of my team. Product teams are usually called squads or pods, and they're cross-functional teams. And what a cross-functional team is, is basically a team comprised of a product manager, engineers, designers, and other experts. And it is cross-functional because all of these people have their own areas of expertise, but they're grouped in the same team. And so as a product manager, where you stand is right in between this Venn diagram where UX, tech, and business interact with each other. So your responsibility is to work with designers, it is to work with engineers, and it is also to work with business, which is usually the leadership or the client. The next table that I have on here outlines the team members that you have on this cross-functional team. As a product manager, it is very important for you to understand who it is that you're working with, and it is very important for you to establish trustworthy and close relationships with your engineers and designers. So I've put on this table some fake names. So I am a product manager, for example, I have a dev lead, design lead, and then I have engineers and designers on the team. So usually software engineers are called devs or developers or engineers. We use these terms interchangeably. And so in a product team, as a product manager, I will usually have engineers and designers. And usually one of those engineers and one of those designers is gonna be a leader, a tech lead or a design lead. Th these people will be a little bit more knowledgeable and a little bit more experienced than the rest of the team. And so they will work with the team to guide them to success, while you as a product manager wanna stay really close to your dev lead and design lead to make sure that you're always staying in touch with the feasibility of the ideas that you're coming up with. The next item that you should really do in planning and prioritization is you want to understand and have a really good command of the objectives and the KPIs for your quarter. So objective key results are basically these huge goals that a company sets on a quarterly basis. And KPI, key performance indicator is basically a fancy way of saying, how will we know that we have actually achieved these OKRs? So OKRs again are our objective key results and KPIs are key performance indicators. So for example, let's say an OKR for Q3 is increasing online sales. And how did I know that this is an OKR? How did this OKR appear on this page? So 
For a product manager to collect OKRs, they have to meet with the leadership and with the clients. Let's say ABC e-commerce company has a head of product, it has a CEO, etc. The CEO and the head of product sit down and they talk about the strategy and the long-term goals of the company. And usually as a product manager, if you are an early career professional and if you've just broken into your career, you will not be the one running those strategy sessions. So you'll go to your CEO, you will go to your head of product, and you will collect these objective key results from your leadership. If this company had a client, for example, if this company was building a product for another client, then the client would also participate and the client would also have a say in the objective key results for the quarter. So for example, one OKR for Q3 2023 is increasing online sales. And how will I know that I have achieved this goal? So I will know that I have achieved this goal if I achieve a 20% increase in monthly revenue compared to the previous quarter. Before you set these OKRs in stone and before you commit to these OKRs, it is also very important for you to meet with your designers and with your tech team to make sure that they're okay with these OKRs as well. Therefore, every quarter you're going to have a quarterly planning meeting with your tech team and your designers to make sure that you're all aligned and you're all committing to all the work that's coming up. While you're planning your OKRs in your quarterly planning meeting, your teams are also gonna come up with t-shirt size estimates. So t-shirt size estimates is basically when your tech team takes a look at these OKRs while you're explaining the business logic and they size the effort. For example, if it's a lot of work, they'll say it is large effort. If it's minimal work, it's something that they're familiar with, that they've worked on before, they're gonna say it's a small size effort. The next thing that you wanna do once you have set your OKRs, you know exactly what you're gonna do in Q3, you want to plan your Q3 in this format. You wanna make sure you know exactly what sprints are gonna be part of Q3. You want to know the timing of these sprints and you want to know your engineering team and design team availability. Because you're gonna be working with these people throughout the quarter, you wanna know if they're actually gonna be there. Does anyone have like a planned vacation? Are people gonna take time off? You wanna know these things because when you're committing to this work, you have to know exactly how many people are gonna be there to get this work done. So just for the sake of this video, to keep it simple, I'm gonna say that my dev team and design team availability is gonna be 100%. No one's taking a sabbatical, no one's going anywhere, everyone's gonna be there. And I've also set my sprint goals for the entire quarter. So some of my sprint goals are improving website performance, enhancing user experience, impl implementing abandoned cart recovery, expanding product catalog, email marketing enhancement, et cetera, et cetera. So on a high level, this is what goes into planning and prioritization for a product manager. Obviously, there are a million other details that we could be sitting here and talking about for hours and hours, but this is all that I wanted to get across in this video. Now, the next item that I wanna talk about is feature development. I'm going to show you an end-to-end -end process for feature development in this part of the video. So let's imagine that I'm a product manager, I work for ABC e-commerce company, and I am responsible this quarter for developing a new feature. And I'm gonna decide that that new feature is gonna be expanding the product catalog. In order to plan this feature, what I need to do first is I need to write out product requirements documents. So a product requirements document is basically a fancy term for a piece of paper that describes what that feature is in great detail. So a product requirements document will include things such as the objective for coming up with this feature, features and functionalities that are gonna go with it, some of the non-functional requirements that are gonna be part of this, what are the constraints, some of the risks, dependencies, the timeline, approval, et cetera, et cetera. So once we have the PRD, the leadership and the client have signed off on it, we can now move on with feature development. 
the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go on this tool called Jira. Now Jira is a tool that product managers, design teams, tech teams use in order to plan and prioritize their work. And what Jira does it is it allows you to have a backlog. It allows you to have sprints. Your, it allows you to write out epics and user stories and prioritize those into the sprints and to then follow up on your team's progress by following a Kanban board. Basically a board that takes the user stories from a to-do status to an in-progress status to a done status. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create an epic and this epic is basically going to be my umbrella and under this umbrella I'm going to house my user stories. And the reason I do that is just for the sake of organization and to be able to track the work that is being done under that epic. Because product catalog can be a huge chunk of work, right? We are not going to get it done in one user story. We need an epic so that we can break down that epic into user stories and those user stories are going to be worked on in our sprints. So when creating an epic, it is very important that your epic has a description, the objectives, and the expected outcomes. What is it that you're trying to do with this feature? What is it that you're trying to achieve? And this is also very important for documentation purposes and for your team to be able to come on this epic and to read on the business logic behind the feature. So I will create an epic and once I have created an epic, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create the user story for my design team. So once design comes up with high fidelity prototypes for what it is that I'm expecting, I'm going to be able to take that design and to communicate that to my engineering team so that they can start implementing the feature. So I can show you how I write out my user stories. I really like the AC01, which means acceptance criteria given when then format. I have used this format for a very long time and I love it. So what I'm doing in this user story is basically I'm adding a title, design expanded product catalog, and then I'm adding three acceptance criteria. Again, I'm breaking down this user story into acceptance criteria. And by describing the acceptance criteria in a given when then format, I'm communicating to the design team what it is that I'm expecting as an outcome of this story. So once the design team takes the story, they will start working on it. And throughout the week, as they work on the story, I will check in with them. I will have stand-ups with them to take a look at the designs that they're coming up with. And let's imagine for the sake of this video that they have come up with this design. So the design team and I will go over the design and we will talk about some of the things that need to be improved, changed, added, removed, etc. So when working with a design team as a product manager, you need to remember that you are not their manager. You are the product's manager. So you want to make sure that you give the design team the dignity to do what they do best, which is to design prototypes. And so just don't forget that. And so once you go over the designs with your design team, let's say they've worked on it for two weeks throughout sprint 14, they are done with the designs. You have signed off on it. The leadership has signed off on it. The client has signed off on it. Now you will take this design and you will take the functional requirements and communicate them to your engineering team because it is now time to code this feature and to make it go live. The next thing that I'm going to do in terms of feature development is I'm going to go and create user stories for my engineering team. I've already created the user stories for my team. The first story is for implementing new product categories pages. The second is for implementing new products and categories. The, fit, the next story is for implementing logic for newly added products. And each one of these stories has acceptance criteria of their own. I'm going to take the design that the designers gave me and I'm going to attach the, those designs to these user stories so that my engineers can see what it is that I'm expecting of them. Before I can prioritize this ticket into Sprint 15, I need to meet with my engineering team and I need to go over these user stories. I need to explain the acceptance criteria, the business logic, 
go over the designs and explain some of the features. And I need to make sure that my team has fully understood what it is that I want them to do. Once they've understood the designs and once they've understood the functional requirements, the team will then brainstorm whether or not this story will be implemented from a backend perspective, a front-end perspective. They'll brainstorm whether or not this user story will need automation, whether or not it will pass in regression testing, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are some technical terms that you're gonna hear on these calls. Once the team has discussed all of that, we're gonna add labels to the story. So we're gonna add, for example, backend label, front-end label, and automation label. And the reason why we're adding these labels is because we want to remember what type of effort went into this ticket. So backend basically means that the team will work on some of the code that will support the behind the scenes of this feature. The front end means that they will write out code that you will actually see as a user. You will be able to click on it. You'll be able to interact with it. So let's imagine that all of our user stories have been sized. So we are now ready to move them to Sprint 15. What we're gonna do is we're going to click Start Sprint. Sprint will start and now we're gonna have a Kanban board. So a Kanban board is basically the board that you're seeing on the screen that will take the tickets from to do to in progress to done. So let's say the sprint started today. So it is very unlikely that your tickets will be done towards the end of that day. So a sprint lasts two weeks, right? So maybe in a couple days, two, three days, you're gonna see some of your tickets move into in progress status and some of your tickets towards the end of the sprint will move into done status. So, and this is where we're gonna talk about meetings and collaboration. A product manager spends a big chunk of their day in meetings and collaborations. And some of these meetings are meetings that happen for planning and prioritization, as we've mentioned earlier, that you'll meet with the CEO, with the leadership, with the clients, et cetera, to understand the objective key results, to do quarterly planning, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the other meetings are the meetings that happen with your cross-functional team. And usually we call it team ceremonies, scrum ceremonies, et cetera. One of the most common meetings that you will have is a daily standup. And what is a daily standup? A daily standup is basically a meeting for you to meet with your engineers and to go over your Kanban board. So you have to participate in daily standups in order to understand how your engineers are doing. Do they need help? Do they have any blockers? Are there any dependencies? Is there anything that you can do to add value to the work that they're doing? You also want to be aware of how the work is progressing throughout the sprints because you want to make sure that your stories do not roll over into the next sprint. You want to make sure that what you've prioritized gets done in that same sprint. And so this will be your daily standup. The next meeting that you will have, and these meetings are gonna take a big chunk of your time, are desk checks. A desk check is when an engineer has implemented code for a certain feature and before they move it to a higher environment, for example, amazon.com, what you see on amazon.com is in production. But before those features got into production, they were in lower environments where you couldn't see them. And basically product and design teams usually work in those low environments. So a desk check is basically when an engineer meets with you and demos the feature to you in a lower environment, in a low risk environment where a user cannot see it. Once you sign off on that feature, the engineer then goes on to move that feature into higher environments, which is basically QA, UAT, user acceptance environment, and then it goes into production where everybody else can see it, where it is seen publicly. One of the other meetings that you're gonna have is a refinement session or a grooming session. And this one we've talked about a little bit earlier. So before you can move your tickets from a backlog into a sprint, you have to meet with your team and you have to explain the user stories to your team so that your team can mark those user stories as reviewed and so that they can size them. So this is called a refinement session, a grooming session. Another meeting that you will have with your team is you will have a sprint planning meeting. And a sprint planning meeting is basically before a sprint starts, you will meet with your team and you will say, hey, 
Here are the stories that are going to be included into the next sprint. All of these stories have been signed off on, they've all been sized, and they all have designs attached to them so that your team knows what's coming up in the next sprint. You could also have team retros where you brainstorm ideas, you give each other feedback, and you learn how to improve and how to work better as a team. And some other meetings such as if you get a production issue, for example, you have a public website, someone's using it, and then something breaks. And in order to fix that issue, you have to get in a last minute meeting with your engineering team to brainstorm solutions for that production issue. So a big chunk of your time is definitely going to be spent in all of these meetings. And the last thing that I want to talk about is documentation. So let's say all of the stories in this sprint have been worked on and they have been done, they have been closed, they have been tested, and the code has been merged into production. Once all of this work has taken place, you want to make sure that as a product manager, you document everything that was developed. And documentation is basically a brief or a long description of what has been done. What kind of tech designs were included in these tickets? What kind of designs were attached to the user stories? Documentation is important so that you can always go back and take a look at what was developed, what was done, so that you can rely on some type of information to fix some of those broken features, or maybe you wanna look back at the work that has been done and leverage that for some of the future work. You will notice that a product manager's mindset is usually twofold. Product managers either live in the past or they live in the future. And this is very typical for any product manager. It is very difficult to be in the moment because you constantly have to think about the past. You're constantly having to be retrospective. You're trying to understand what's been done before so that you can leverage that knowledge. And you also have to live in the future so that you can make these features come true. And so this was documentation. There are many, many organizations and companies that don't have documentation or they don't maintain it because software changes so much and it changes so quickly. It can be really, really hard to maintain documentation sometimes. Um, but this is it for today's video. I hope that I didn't overwhelm you with too much technical detail, but I hope that this video was useful to you. If you want more videos about product management and what product managers do in their day-to-day -day lives, please leave a comment under this video and I'll try to respond to you. If you have any questions or suggestions, please let me know in the comments down below. And I look forward to seeing you in my next video.